Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Scott Reeb, who is in Denton, Texas. How are you doing, Scott? Doing great, John. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And Scott formed Reeb Laws, a full service law firm that focuses on developing strong relationships with clients to make your legal life easier easier and you wanted to be a game cha game changer change the game in the legal industry with um you have multi-licensed lawyers bringing business one-of-a-kind legal um subscriptions and, and services to people that's right yeah we do things a little differently here excellent we always like to talk to people who do things differently and today what we're going to talk about is shatterproofing your small business so how to build your business today to be protected tomorrow so um Scott, what are some of the fundamental um, errors that you see people make when they have a small business that leads them to, as you say, their business being shattered as, a, as opposed to being shatterproof? Yeah, there's, a, there's two or three really uh, kind of big ones that we see a lot. One is that they're still operating as a sole proprietor. They haven't formed any sort of legal structure to separate their person from their business. So everything's exposed. And when things go wrong, uh, then it all crashes down around them. Uh, the other thing that I see a lot of is people still doing handshake deals instead mm. of written contracts. And it's just too easy now to do written agreements. You need to do them. Written agreements keep honest people honest. If someone doesn't want to do a written agreement with you, uh, you know, signs should be going off in your head that this is a warning, Will Robinson, don't do this deal. Mm. Uh, and then the other is that people are not protecting their brand. And they're, not, they're, not, you know, they're not registering their trademarks. They're not protecting their online courses with copyrights. And that's kind of the three big things we've been seeing recently. Yeah, because obviously um, when somebody starts a business, it's very easy to sort of think that you're either, you know, saving money or whatever, like by staying maybe as a sole proprietor, maybe not going through the process of, of, of turning it into any kind of like um, uh, corporation or anything like that. Um, but as you say, I mean, you're leaving yourself hugely exposed when you do that. And I think from a discipline point of view, too, it's a good thing because those requirements of moving from sole proprietor to having a company, there, there's some good disciplines involved in that. Yeah, the, I mean, I've, anecdotally, I think it increases your chances of success greatly. I've heard 60% uh, is the, the increase you get just by following the formality that it takes to mm -hmm. be a corporation or an LLC. Uh, something mentally kicks in in your particular cortex and your brain starts working on this more serious business now that you have because you've taken those steps. And they're not hard steps, um, mm -hmm. but a lot of people just aren't doing them. Like you said, they're either too busy or like Gerber says, they've had this entrepreneurial seizure and they just forget to do it. They get busy mm -hmm. uh, being busy. Yeah, because obviously when you go, and I mean, I've done it myself, when you go through that process, it can be, it can seem a little tedious and a little bit, you know, taking you away from doing what you want to be doing um, but at the same time there is something as you say when you have that binder with all of your documents and that in it or you can look at the structure of your business there is something that says it's almost says in your brain says okay now I'm a real business yeah I agree yeah and and you were and you were saying that um, you know the handshake deals is another one I mean that's interesting too isn't it because I guess a lot of people start selling when they set up a business sometimes obviously they go start selling to people they know they do their you know contacts and whatever and people and i always find that a lot of people come out of the woodwork and they mean well and they say oh i'll help you i can do this for you and i can help you with that and yes it's very tempting to end up with a lot of handshake deals but as you say you know contracts are your friends yeah for example one of our access clients who's in the fitness space online fitness mm -hmm. training um, was hiring a contractor to create videos for her business for social on social media and the contract that they, there was a written contract, but it didn't have in it uh, a work for hire clause. Mm -hmm. So she wouldn't have owned the copyright to the materials that were being created. She didn't know that we were able to fix that very quickly. And now she has a document that's enforceable. We'll keep the creator honest and she'll be able to use it in her business. But it's just those little things that, entrepreneurs aren't trained to do. That's not what you're supposed to be doing. And so we can come in behind and, and stand you up and make sure those kind of things aren't, aren't being missed. 
Yeah, and I think that's an excellent example that you use there because it is very easy to not understand um, the different contracts when you're working with contractors as work for hire as opposed to you know time and materials and all that kind of stuff, and uh, and the and the ownership of the final product, which is critical because as you say in that case, if this person's running an online fitness. I mean, the videos are the IP in many ways, you know, that, and if you lose control of that, then you, you've lost control of your business. Yeah, another one that people lose a lot of control of, I see them lose their control over, is their actual website, where the web, mm -hmm. the web company will have in their contract that they own the content. If you leave that agreement uh, for any reason before you've fully completed it, you don't get the content and you have to start all over. And it could even be that it was their problem. They, they've caused the problem mm -hmm. that you're, why you're leaving. So you have to be really careful um, even when you do written agreements that you're, that you're getting some expert eyes on those so that you don't make mistakes. Yeah. And that's why sometimes as we, as I said, is when, you know, people, you know, come to help you and all of that, um, that, yeah, it may, it may seem a little awkward, uh, because you know them, but form, uh, formalizing things in a simple contract, as you say, with ownership and all that could save you a lot in the long run. Cause to be honest, as I would say, you don't really know people till money's involved. That is true. And, and if it is an important friendship or relationship, it's, mm -hmm. that even means more. And so you want to make sure that it's very clear so that when there's a disagreement or misunderstanding, you can go back to a written document and go, now this is, this is what we said. Okay. Yes. So you're not calling someone a liar. Mm -hmm. You're just saying we've misremembered. Let's go back to the document. Hey, this is easy. I, I said, I do this. You said you do that. Let's fix it. We're back in good standing. Yeah. I like that. We've misremembered. We've just misremembered something here. Let's go check it. But I mean, I think that's a, yeah, I think that's a, and it's a great point. And, and I guess the other part then is if you really, really don't feel comfortable doing that with somebody who you know or whatever, perhaps then you shouldn't, you shouldn't engage with that person. It's better just to say, no, it's okay. I'm, I've, I've hired this company to do it. Yeah. Sometimes you need to keep business separate and, mm -hmm. And again, if someone is hesitant to do a written agreement with you, warning signals should be going off. That's a problem. They don't, if they, if they mean what they say, then they shouldn't mind signing off on it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's always a good rule of thumb. It's absolutely. If somebody doesn't want to put it down on paper, doesn't want to have something formal. And it doesn't, and I guess the thing is, you know, for a lot of the, especially when you're a small business starting off, um, I mean, a lot of the contracts that you're going to need are going to be very pr pretty straightforward uh, and, and not that complicated. So somebody shouldn't have a problem with signing something that's pretty standard. No, we, and we really focus on trying to cut through legal mumbo jumbo and make mm -hmm. contracts simple, I mean, they're, they're the lifeblood of a business. And if you hand someone a contract to do business with you and they don't understand it, it's too, it's really complicated. It's long. They're less likely to close that deal with you. So we need to make contracts that are easy to understand that track the deal. Everyone understands it. We sign at the bottom. It's friendly. It's easy. You know, most of our contracts start with something like congratulations for doing, for doing this deal. One encourage business. A lot of lawyers um, with good intentions are mm -hmm. deal killers because they write their contracts in a way that no one in their right mind would sign them. Yeah, and yeah. we and try to write entrepreneurial agreements that everyone would want to sign because they're fair. They're not giving one side an advantage over the other. They're just documenting the deal in a way that can be enforced by both sides. Yeah, because there's often a feeling is like when you see those documents, as you said, I mean, you would look at it and you go, wow, this is, we're just trying to do something simple here. But then I have this big, long document full of all this legalese. And it seems sometimes mm -hmm. that it's, you know, a lot of cut and paste and a lot of stuff that's really extraneous to what you're trying to do. Yeah. I mean, there's really about eight things you need to look at in a contract that just have to be there. Um, if there's not that, there's not that many things that have to be in an agreement. You can do that in two pages very easily. Um, you can do it in an email if you just mm -hmm. track it correctly. It's not that hard to have a written agreement that's very enforceable, keeps everyone on the right page. And if not, you can take, the, take it to court, win your lawsuit and move on. But that's the last place we want to be. We want sure. the document to be, some, to be the way we keep out of court, not into court. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And if, every, and if the contracts are simple, they're signed and people understand them, then it should, it should severely reduce the need for any, uh, any conflict or court. And, yeah, and then big you said, contracts are the thing that we litigate the most. Yeah, no, I can imagine. Um, and so, and um, when you say brand, brand protection, what do you mean by that? Uh, like sales pop uh, is is your is the brand mm -hmm. that's obvious behind yeah. you. Um, 
And so that's your, that should be trademarked with the federal uh, mm-hmm. office, United States Patent Trademark Office, so that no one else can start a sales pop uh, mm-hmm. and compete with you. And if, and the problem that happens a lot we, is that you'll, someone will start a business, create, think they have a creative brand. They find out that someone else has already had that idea for 10 years. And now mm-hmm. you're building your business on someone else's brand. They find out, they come after you, shut you down, sue you for the profits, take that money from you, and now you have to start all over. Well, the easier way is when you create this idea, then go to the trademark office, have a trademark lawyer do a search, make sure that you can own that brand, register it, now it's yours, now build it. Too many people build it and then go back and go, oh, this is valuable, now I need to protect it, and it's too late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they, and as you say, then they find there's a company, you know, a small company somewhere in the corner of the country that had the same brand for 20, for 40 years or something yeah. that you, yeah. And it is, it is a yeah. simple, it is a simple thing because I think maybe because people get so um, excited around like figuring out the name for their company, they spend probably more time getting a bunch of logos and they get excited about choosing the design of the logo and all of that and they forget about something as fundamental as figuring out whether the name <laughs> is is trademark yeah and a lot of people will do an, a url search and mm-hmm. if it's a, if the if they can get the domain they want they think oh it's it must be available i can just go with it and that's just so far from the truth and can get you in a lot of trouble fast yeah and and um and what are some of the other things apart from this that uh, small businesses should be thinking about in order to avoid problems in the future? You know, uh, in our in our book, Five Strategies to Shatterproof a Small Business, mm-hmm. uh, we've talked about one of them, this need to have the corporate entity. Uh, yeah. Two would be to document everything. So have contracts uh, with your vendors, with your customers. If you have employees or team members, you want to document that. And then we want to protect our, our intellectual property. And the other thing is we want to make sure we're not using someone else's intellectual property. We've touched on that a little bit. Yeah. But where people really get in trouble is on the right. We're putting together a website. Uh, maybe we've hired someone to do it and we need pretty images. Well, yeah. um, if you're not a photographer, then you don't have your own images. And so you start finding them on the internet. I mean, they're everywhere. And mm-hmm. you find the one you like and suddenly it's on your website, even though you don't have permission because no one's going to care, right? Sure. Well, they do care. And mm-hmm. all those images are tagged. They have trolls looking for them. And suddenly you'll get a cease and desist letter and pay me $10,000 for using my image uh, from a lawyer that's that representing the copyright holder. And there's no defense to it. You're just stuck. Yeah. Uh, it could even be, like I said, that your webmaster did it without your consent. You're on the hook. So as entrepreneurs, we need to respect intellectual property rights and make sure that we're buying the pictures we're using or we're making sure they're royalty free um, and that we're doing following the rules. If you do that, you know, then you'll save yourself a lot of headache and it's just the right thing to do. If you're creating something out there, you don't want someone else taking it. And so you shouldn't either, even if you're doing so kind of in an innocent way. I mean, Copying is, you know, or imitation is the highest form of flattery, but it's also theft. So we've got to be really careful uh, how you do that. And sometimes it's because you're in a hurry. You know, Google has all these images out there. Just slow down, find a couple of go-to spots where you can get your uh, royalty-free yeah. images or uh, some inexpensive images that you can buy and just do it the right way and, and make sure that your webmasters, your social media managers all know that there's a written policy in place that they can't that you have to have permission to use an image it's a really big deal yeah and it and it's a very very easy one to fall foul of and that's why yeah i think that's a great thing to highlight here and encourage people that and nowadays to be honest um there's a lot of there's a lot of sites you you know you can subscribe to and get your get your royalty free images you know and pay a little they're not as expensive as they used to be there's some very creative solutions out there but I, I would definitely underline that because it's not a fun process. And as you can say, you can end up actually forking out quite a lot of money um, if you use an image that doesn't belong to you. And to be honest, the money that you end up paying out is probably 10 or 20 times the subscription amount that if you'd have paid to the royalty, um, you know, the, the stock photographic uh, uh, site in the first place. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, what are some of the other of your, of your five ways to shatterproof? You know, the first one was the form, form an entity. 
Uh, so you mm -hmm. have legal separation from your business. That's the foundation of your business. The second uh, one that we haven't talked about is that you need to establish a team of key advisors. Mm -hmm. The key advisors to uh, every entrepreneur should have, they should have a CPA so that you can, they can help you set up your books, your chart of accounts, show you how to take care of your taxes and make sure that you're making a profit and then paying the taxes mm -hmm. appropriately. You're taking care of payroll through them. They can set all that up for you. So important. The next advisor you want to have is a banker and not a bank. There's a bank on every corner. You need mm -hmm. someone that you have a relationship with, that you have them on your speed dial. They have you, you have cell numbers so that if you need something, you can get it right. They're the people that run your checking account. They help you set up lines of credit. They're the ones that are going to cover a deposit, cover a check for you. If the deposit is going to be a day late, you have to have those relationships in place to be able to move quickly. And in this world, you need to be able to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. The next, advisor you just have to have is an insurance broker, someone that can help you cover this risk. Business is full of risk. There's ways to cover it. If you have a good advisor that is taking the time to understand your business so that they can say, here's the list of coverages you need. And then you're like, okay, I can't afford all those. Where do I start? And so you prioritize them and just start taking them down. And then you know that when something goes wrong, you've got your corporate entity with, behind you and then you have insurance to come in and, and, and to defend you and cover it if you've messed up because you will mess up at some point. Though so something will happen and you will need that insurance. You want to have the right coverage. And then the next advisor that you need is you need to have a business coach. If you're going to uh, have exponential success, you need someone that's helping you, uh, either giving you the map to where you need to go if you already have it mapped out, then they're helping you stay accountable to your, to your action steps to get to your goal. It's just imperative that you have that person in your life that you're spending time with every week, uh, every month that is tracking with you to make sure that you're getting the kick in the tail you need to do what you said you wanted to do. Otherwise, you may eventually get there. But if you want to, if you want to take the direct course, then get a business coach uh, to help you get there. And then last but not least, that you need a business lawyer, and I, what I would call an access lawyer. So this is right. someone that you have a relationship with set up, that you have on-demand on access, so you can text them, call them, email them, Slack them, whatever way you want to get hold of them with a question right now. Having the right information at the right time is often the difference between success and failure. If you're in a business meeting and something comes up and you have a legal question, you don't have time to Google a lawyer, set an appointment next week, pay a retainer, then get the advice, then go make the deal. It's too late. You need to be able mm -hmm. to be sending the text in the meeting or step out and make a phone call yeah. and walk back in and look like, a, look like you're a superstar because you have the right information. And to do that, you have to set it up in advance. And the way we do that is through our access plan where you have a monthly subscription with a set a uh, group of uh, things that are included in your plan. And one of those is always that you have an unlimited ability to call us and ask us questions. And if you have those advisors in place, along with those other four uh, key uh, strategies, yeah. your business will be shatterproof. Now, that doesn't mean that your business can't be hurt. What it means is like the car that we drive that has that shatterproof glass. When a rock hits your your business vehicle, it'll mark the glass and then you can yep. go down the road and fix it later. It's, mm -hmm. it's going to happen. So we just want to minimize it so that you can stay the course and fix it later. And that's the idea of shatterproofing. Yeah, no, I love that. And I love, I mean, all the advisors you've said there, just one, I just underlined really quickly because I would say it's probably the one that people maybe skip over the most and that's the business coach. Um, because, uh, you know, sometimes they say, yeah, accountant, I get it and all that. But I always say to people, right, is you probably invest, you've probably got a hobby. Maybe you invest in, maybe you have somebody helps you with golf. Maybe like I do, I go to martial arts or whatever. Um, maybe you yeah. should actually invest some money in the thing that, maybe you should invest some coaching money in the thing that puts bread on your table. Right. Yeah. yeah. But as if I said, I want to get in shape, I hire a trainer. Yeah. If I want to get my business in shape, I should hire a business coach. It's just, yeah. it's really that simple. And, and to have that person who is external to your business, who just has your best interests at heart, but isn't in the business like you are, I think is really a, it's such a great thing to have because, you know, sometimes you just can't see the, you know, the forest for the trees and, and sometimes you're just too deep into it. 
but sometimes you just it just gets overwhelming and you know maybe you make poor decisions because you're feeling overwhelmed because you've nobody to bounce things off yeah totally yeah yeah, I, I, that's great. Um, so um, let's just recap the, the five uh, areas again, uh, Scott, before we finish. Sure. One is to uh, establish your business on a strong foundation, which is a corporate entity or LLC. Second is that you want to have a, a team of key advisors. We went through those advisors. Mm -hmm. Third is document everything. So you're going to have contracts with everything you do. They don't have to be complicated. They just need to be tracking the deal. And third, uh, would be that you want to make sure that you've protected uh, all of your, or fourth, all your intellectual property. And then fifth is don't use someone else's intellectual property. If you'll mm -hmm. follow those five strategies, you'll be way on your way to shatterproofing your business and never getting into big trouble where you uh, have to pay a lot of lawyer fees to get out. Yeah, that's fantastic. Listen, Scott Reeb, thank you so much for your time today. All of Scott's information will be in his contributor bio below here, so you can contact him at reeblaw.com. That's R-E-I-B-L-A-W.com. Um, this has been fantastic. Great advice. I would encourage anybody who is a sole proprietor or a small business, please go check out, check out Reeb Law. Again, uh, thank you for your time today, Scott, and I will see all of the rest of you for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thanks, John.